What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome into an all new episode of the Pack a Day podcast, along with the Acme Packing Company. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. And joining me, as always, is the one and only Justice Mosqueda. Again, you can find him on Acme Packing Company. You can find him on social media at J U M O S Q. You find me at Andy Herman NFL. It doesn't matter. We get to talk about a win, Justice. It has been far too long. Oh, tell me all the good news. What do you got for me? The offense looked much better in the second half. I mean, that's probably their best half of football since the Saints game, probably. And I guess the yeah. Saints game was just a quarter, really. But no, I mean, that was good what we saw from them in the second half. That's improvement. That's what we wanted to see. Now, you're going to have to do it against a team that actually has an NFL quarterback <laughs> at some point. But progress. Progress is good. And um, I I've said it a couple of times, but – this is much closer to looking like what I kind of expected this season to be. Signs of progress, a little bit of signs on offense, good defense, um, some really dumb mistakes mixed in um, from a young team. That's kind of what I expected. Took us nine weeks and a backup quarterback to get here, but I'll, I'll take whatever wins I can get, um, both literally and figuratively at this point. And, you know, just kind of talking about that progress, I did feel like there were things like tangible things that felt better in this game. As you mentioned, the offense in the second half, I did feel like they moved, you know, just kind of the line of scrimmage much better. We didn't see yeah. as many five defenders all of a sudden in the running back's face behind the line of scrimmage. It just, it looked a lot more competent. And I think when you have uh, an offensive line that just blocks better, I thought this was probably their best offensive line performance since that week one game against Chicago. When you do that, everything starts to look a lot better. And I think that's what we saw in this one. Yeah. And it's, it's not even <clears throat> like the line was super cohesive. Right. In terms yes, of just who was out there. I mean, they rotated in and out, you know, the left tackle position because of Nyman's injury. And then Ryan was out there on that drive for that first touchdown. Right. So, yep. you know, they had about seven guys who were playing pretty solid football up front. And yeah, I, you know, to your point, I think that was the big difference. I mean, there was a couple contested catches that finally went our way. Right. Watson. And yep. I think it was Dobbs who had the other one. Um, the fumbles. Right. Like those kind of suck. The, the penalties, like I don't, still don't know what we're doing with the offensive offsides thing. Um, but yeah, the offensive line played better. Um, the passing game in the second half looked better. I mean, I, I what was it? Love, I think at the half had like sixty yards or something like that. So it wasn't great. But the second half, he played a whole lot better. Per usual, uh, per usual, the second half usually goes much better for this offense. But uh, even even in the first half, I know like, if you look at the numbers between both Love and Rippon in the first half, it's, it's not fun football. But overall, even some of the movement I saw in the first half, out, like the, some of the drives stalling because of, a, like in the offensive offsides and things like that, things are going to happen. Then, of course, you get the easy completion to start the second half, and then Wicks fumbles. You've got an Aaron Jones fumble mixed in there. Still some disjointed stuff, still stuff that needs to get cleaned up. But I did feel like it, like I said, it just felt a little bit more substantial. It felt real. It felt like like actual NFL offense, which unfortunately we just haven't seen a whole heck of a lot of. Yeah, and I mean, that defense is still real defense, right? Like yep. they still, I mean, Aaron Donald was still out there. You know, they have football players on that side of the ball. I know they're not spending. I think it's the Rams and the Packers are spending the least amount of money in the league overall. I know the Packers are spending the least on the offensive side of the ball. Um but they were able to move the ball and they could have had a couple more opportunities, right? We're talking about a missed field goal. We're talking about an Aaron Jones fumble after that big screen. We're talking about yeah. the Tavian Wicks fumbling after getting a pretty crucial catch. Um, and we're talking about two drives that were dead because of the offensive offsides on, on the quarterback sneak attempts, right? So, you know, if they clear, clean some of that stuff up, maybe the first half does look a little bit better. Um, I know all those plays weren't in the first half, but yeah, I mean, the 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 takeaways that come out of this game are offensive side, thumbs up, things are going in a better direction. I really do not care about the wins and losses as much as I just want to see line goes up on the offensive side. Um, on the defensive side, I'm willing to throw everything out uh, of that game. Brett Rippon is not an NFL quarterback. As someone who personally scouted uh, XFL quarterbacks back in 2020, I feel pretty confident saying Rippon, unless he would have convinced the coach like Mark Tressman was convinced of like an Aaron Murray. I, I don't think he could have gotten the starting job with the XFL. So I, I legitimately don't believe that he's an NFL player. So you kind of got to throw out the defensive stuff. 
Yeah, that's that's always tough. And I did want to kind of start there with Joe Barry's defense. This is one of those that feels a little bit of, you know, fool's gold at the same token. You, th you think? A little yeah. bit? <laughs> a little I tweeted bit. out, I tweeted out, you know, they've let they've allowed less than 16 points a game over their last what is it, four or five games? Oh, that's why that's why this 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 conversation topic is on here. I wanted to pick your brain. <laughs> every on every reply is just who have they played? And I'm like, yeah, dude, yeah, that's kind of the point. Also, some of those offenses, like you talk about uh, the Denver game where the defense was saying that the opposing offense was just, you know, quote unquote, running their stuff. And eventually they were going to get a couple yards because the offense wasn't able to score on the opposite side of the ball. Right. So it's not like teams are throwing a bunch of tricky stuff at them. I, I thought Barry did a lot more walk down stuff with the inside linebackers, even with McDuffie in the lineup. Um, I thought that was a nice change up. I, I don't know how much credit we give Joe Barry. So so this is one question I had with Tex. Are we at a point now, because Barry's defense had success despite the team losing games, that we are now at a point where LaFleur and Barry are probably handcuffed to each other this year, where outside of complete and total collapse in the second half of the season on the defensive side of the ball, if we get you know this Packers first half of the season in the second half of the season. The only way you fire Barry is probably if you fire LeFleur at that point, right? Depends. There's always those situations where they go to the coach and say, Hey, we want to keep you, but you need to make some changes on your staff. We don't believe in X yeah. or Y or whatever the case may be. I think that option exists. Matt LeFleur could, you know, like let's say they win two or you know, two more games or something like that the rest of the season. And Matt LaFleur just feels pressure and like, all right, I got to try. I got to do something different. We need some different ideas in the building. Maybe he does go and try to find a different offensive and defensive coordinator to what you said. I don't know. It was last week or a couple of weeks ago of like, if you're going to try to find new coordinators, it's probably a lot easier if you find them with a new coach than with uh, yep. a coach that's already gone through coordinators um, on both sides and on special teams. And they might be tethered to a one year coach if things don't go well next year. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept. I, I'm at a loss for what the organization and Matt LaFleur thinks of Joe Barry. I'm also at a loss of like, if we're, if we're being honest now, totally different resources that were given to both sides of the ball, but the defense has you know, been better than the offense. I think on the whole, although not like yeah. exceptionally. So I don't know. I know the easy answer for everyone listening is just like, yeah, you fired Joe Barry. It's, I don't know that it's necessarily that easy, even if it should be, I, I'm very interested to see just a how the rest of the season goes, and then b what does happen with the coordinators. I think if Lafleur's back, the only one I feel very confident saying is back, unless he gets a head coaching job, is is Basaccia. Yeah, and I thought his comments this week were pretty interesting. Um, if you juxtapose what kind of he said, and we'll explain what he said in a second, what he said, and then all all the stuff Raiders. I don't know if you caught what Jake Glazer had reported, like messaging matters a lot in terms of coaches and someone asked, I don't know if it was you or not. I can't remember. Um, someone asked Basaccia if um, he would have entertained a head coaching job, you know, this upcoming off season, which like kind of a silly question because the, the Colts interviewed him last year. He was willing to take that interview. Yeah. Um, his response was basically like, yeah, like the longer you're in coaching, the more, you know, you get that urge to want to be a head coach, which is, totally normal and you yep. shouldn't push, punish a special teams coordinator for saying that like of, of course. course he should i mean lafleur said that he should be a head coach aaron Rodgers said that he should be a head coach like it's not like this is coming as a shock to anyone and then someone asked about the raiders if they if he would interview with him um in january and he was basically like yeah i'll ask in january so <laughs> he's kind of leaving those doors open right and he's kind of Sticks out like a sore thumb in terms of if Lafleur has moved on from in season, like he would be the guy to take over. And obviously, um, if things go as well as it went for the offense in the second half of the Rams game, like I don't think we're really having these conversations. But after the first half of the season that the Packers had, you know, particularly after Week One, I mean, what the second half of this game in the fourth quarter against the Saints, like that's really been the only time that they played good ball. Um, you know, I, th I think it's on the table right now as a possibility. We'll have to see. Again, we're kind of week to week 
with everything, I think. Um, in terms of job security and stuff like that. I think Goot's comments were pretty interesting to shed some light into kind of what the internal uh, dialogue is in the building where he came out and basically said in his one available presser in season, you know, after the trade deadline, he was like, yep, we expected the offense to play better in the first half and we expect them to play better in the second half. Like they were, they aren't shying away about what type of standard they have in Green Bay, which is common. I mean, we, we talked about this before when I listed off all those names last week. You know, if you're this late into your coaching stint at one program, you can't lose double-digit games and assume that you're going to keep your job. Like, that only happens for guys who end up winning Super Bowls, right? Like Sean McVay yeah. or, some, you know, John Gruden back in the day, uh, Harbaugh, right? Like, stuff like that. So, Yeah, I mean, I think the rest of the season is, like, this sort of interesting mix of competitive games – Games that are sort of um, house money, meaning like you're not expected to win. Nobody's expecting you to do well. And if you do well, it's going to be a huge, a huge thing and like a big bonus. And then there's like these landmine games out there that like, like very similar to this one, Brett Rippon starting quarterback. Like that's a, that's a can't lose game. It, maybe it's not a must win. It's, a, it's literally a, a can't lose, right? You cannot lose that game. And we're having obviously a much different conversation. We can talk about like how much we want to caveat this win to death because of Brett Rippon and the overall play of the Rams. That's fine. But we're having a whole different conversation today if they end up losing that game. So they took care of business and they got the win and they did what they needed to do 20 to three. And I don't necessarily know that the, it was even that close. If you look at kind of like total yardage and things like that, but yeah. like Pittsburgh to me is a competitive game. That That's one that should be rem- like mostly competitive chargers. We can argue, but I, I don't have expectations for that Chargers, Lions, Chiefs trio of games. They probably need to be like at least competitive and like one of them would be nice. And I think the Chargers one is probably the one that stands out the most. Um, but those are three of more of like a little bit more of house money where, y- again, there's not going to be a ton of expectations going into those three. Then you have New York, which is uh, probably one of those where with no Daniel Jones and a really bad New York team, even if it is in New York, yeah. That's one you can't lose. I'll come back to Tampa in a second. To me, Carolina is one you can't lose. Chicago at home at the end of the season is probably pretty close to a can't lose. And you got the two other ones. You've got at Minnesota. I think that's probably maybe a little bit more in the competitive one, just based on what we saw from Minnesota last week. But we could, you know, that, that one's up for grabs. And then Tampa, I would probably put a little bit more in that competitive one as well. But there's a couple of those landmine games, New York, Carolina, Chicago, we're like, you lose those, and then we're, we're having a lot different conversation of where Lafleur stands as coach. Yeah, I think the, the way to do it is to kind of uh, count the losses, I guess, is the best way to do it. And it's like, all right, they got probably five losses before it's like 50-50, right? Between, you know, yeah. in terms of like, is Matt gone or not? Um, and we're probably staring down the barrel of at least three in terms of that Chargers Lions chief stretch. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, that kind of puts into perspective how important this upcoming game against the Steelers is, right? Even though I think they're like three and a half point underdogs. I know there's a bunch of weird stats that you could throw out for either side, right? You want on one side, you could say Kenny Pickett's only thrown more than one touchdown in one single game in his NFL career. On the flip side, it's, Mike Tomlin's never had a losing season in his career, right? And, you know, he's the face of stability that the, you know, the Packers thought that they were going to have coming into this season where they were like, yeah, well, Matt will figure it out, right? Yep. You know, we're rebuilding, but he'll figure it out in the same way some of these other guys have, right? Um, Harbaugh's done it in the past, you know, Tomlin, guys like that haven't had a fully loaded deck. So, yeah, I mean, this upcoming game is a big one. Um, it's a much better team than that Rams team but it's still a big one. Yeah, otherwise, you, we're basically just coming off a four-game losing streak than a win. I could see another potential, if they lose this one, four-game losing streak and then a win um, with Pittsburgh, Chargers, Lions, Chiefs losses, and then potentially a Giants win. Then, like I said, but, the last but to, four- your, to, to your point, though, too, you know, you were talking about being competitive and stuff like that. It's not all about the wins and losses. It's also like how it looks is going to matter. Like how it looks yep. is going to matter. Optics if, is huge. Yeah. If the offense looks like it had, like if you copy paste the last month of the Packers offense and paste it into the upcoming month, I think that's when things get really prickly. 
It has to be better than that. You can lose games, but the offense has to keep taking those steps forward. And I do think too, like if we want to be, I think that like probably what we've been talking about is a little bit, maybe more of like the pessimistic approach. If you want to look at from an optimistic side of things, it, what I said from the very beginning of the season is I wanted this team to play their best football down the stretch, not as a like to get in the playoff sort of thing, just playing better football so I can see like proof of concept of where they're going and that they could potentially carry this over into something next season. That's what I really hope for. And like, regardless of what happens in those next four games, you line up a, a last five games of Giants, Buccaneers, Panthers, Vikings, Bears, that lines up pretty well to like, if you do need to go four and one or five and one to save your job or whatever it is, like you can't come up with a much better schedule than that where Giants quarterback in pop, probably top two quarterbacks, maybe not going to be going in that game. Tampa is going to be competitive, but that's a game at home in December for Tampa that will should be winnable. Carolina winnable, Minnesota backup quarterback winnable, and then the Bears who they already beat this season. So um, I do think that, uh, and again, I'm not saying like, <laughs> I'm not talking run the table here, but I do think they have a, a rather favorable end of the season schedule where if we do want to see this team play their best football and if they do need to reel off some wins to save somebody's job, that's not that's not a bad five to have to, to kind of rally the troops at the end of the year. Yeah, I think the only thing that kind of throws a monkey wrench into that is, well, we, talk, we talked about this last week, right, where there's only two reasons to move on from LaFleur in season, right? One is you're changing the infrastructure of the team. Yeah. And I think with the confidence that Goot spoke out at the trade deadline, I think it's pretty clear that that's not something that is going to happen. Like they're not going to completely revamp how the front office and the entire structure of the organization works in the final year of Mark Murphy, you know, seeing over this team and then passing it off to another president, right? Yep. Um so the only other reason that you would want to get to not not even get to market early because that's that's that was that option right changing the front office you want to get to market early pitch agents on all this stuff about how things are going to change in Green Bay the other reason would be um, to give Basachi a legitimate shot and that's a question where you know if you drop eight of your last nine games right going into that giants game on december 11th which is the one i'm i'm circling too right like yep. what what the internal um dialogue is of the team is going to be incredibly important on that date is that the point where they're like hey okay let's give uh rich a shot for the last four games like that's the only question i have that's a really interesting way of looking at it because i didn't really look at it that way of yeah, if they do have struggle and, and they do lose Pittsburgh Chargers, Lions, Chiefs, which again is not like they're going to be underdogs, I think, in all four of those games, barring like a QB yes. um, injury or something. If you do go one in eight in a nine game stretch, that's, that's far from ideal. And that would be very interesting to see. All right, last last month and a quarter of the season, what do you do in that situation? One in eight, yeah. but it's really what it's what two two and nine over that stretch and it's because you beat a non-nfl quarterback and then because of the fourth quarter historic comeback against the saints the same. right so with a backup quarterback yeah and again a lot of this is going to depend to not on just what the wins and losses look like but the offense um, yep and i know it's weird having these vibes coming off of a win but you know, we're week to week right now. And it's important to kind of do that temperature check of like, okay, where are we at? Not only in the short term, but like in the context of the whole season and how Goot's talking about stuff and how um Basachi is talking about stuff. LaFleur is talking about stuff. Hell, Joe Barry said that he was surprised that, uh, or shocked, I think, um, that they traded Russell Douglas, right? Like all that stuff is important little tidbits to kind of analyze like where this team is at yeah i totally agree all right now that we've buzz killed everyone's uh victory tuesday um going over all the things that we have to realistically think about let's have a little bit of fun i want to get your takes on i don't, I don't know we got like maybe nine or ten players here and i just want to know do we need to see more of these players moving forward so i will start with everyone's hot topic of the week now that we got a little bit of a little taste do we need to see more of Sean Ryan? 
I don't think so. I mean, we're a couple of weeks removed from Sean Ryan being Royce Newman's backup. I don't know how many reps he's getting in practice. Um, he looked really good on that one drive. Um, was yep. moving guys off of the ball. But I'm hesitant to use one drive as a example of what an offensive lineman is like. I know John Runyon Jr. hasn't had the best season. He's probably cost himself a bunch of money over the last two years. Exactly. But um, I don't think so. I just thought it was interesting. He got ahead of Newman. Um, that's a positive sign. But I, I think that's more of a 2024 thing than a 2023 thing. I'm a little bit closer to the opposite side, I think, than you but I agree with you for now. I don't think I'd change anything up quite yet, but I am getting a little bit of an itchy trigger finger with John Runyon Jr., specifically because he's not under contract next year, and Sean Ryan is. And I think if we do start seeing a couple losses and you not you know, having the effectiveness on the offensive line and Runyon you know, continues to struggle, then I feel more like, all right, let's, let's give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, it's not like you're married to it. You can always go back to John Runyon Jr. at any given point but I am getting closer to that point of like, let's just try because he's under contract next year. But for the most part, I think it's a positive step. Like you said, he's ahead of Royce yeah. Newman now. I don't think you need to make any drastic changes. Stick with stick with what mostly worked this past week. And then, but like I said, I think I just probably have a little bit of a quicker quicker hitch if like if things started going wrong. And I, th I felt like maybe Sean Ryan could give a little bit of a boost, especially as a run blocker. Yeah, he did solid on that one drive. Um but again, it's only one drive, and that was really his first. I'm all in. I'm all in on seven snaps <laughs> in, the, in the second quarter of a game against the Rams. He did get in uh, eight snaps at the end for Elton Jenkins, too, which I did not recognize. Uh oh, on, when all the backups were, when like Ben Sims and Emmanuel Wilson. And Emmanuel all those guys Wilson, yep. He did get in there, too. But yes, I digress. All right. Speak of the devil, uh, number two on my list. Do we need to see more Emmanuel Wilson? Small sample size as well, but he has a nice bounce run to the outside. Would you like to see more, or are you cool with him being running back three? I'm cool with him being running back three. I mean, Patrick Taylor was getting looks ahead of him a couple weeks ago, too. Um, Wilson's fine to me. Um, what the hell were they doing at the end of the game? Do you understand what they were doing at the end of the game? They could have run out the clock. Just down, right? They wanted those looks for Megan Wilson, I guess. Um, you know, obviously, the Packers made the running back change. We're recording this on a Monday. Um, to kind of peek through the curtain. Uh, so today the Packers made the switch up with the practice squad running back. So yep. I don't know if that had anything to play with it where they were like, you know, do we want Wilson or uh, do we want James Robinson to potentially push him or something like that? And they just made that decision based off of two carries. I, I, I don't know. I really don't know what happened at the end of the game there. It was weird because they could have just kneeled down, right? They could have just, they didn't yes. need to run another play. And then they, they decided ran, to got play. holding. And then the clock. Partly, they declined it because it stops the clock and it actually gives you an opportunity to get the ball back. Not that it mattered at that point, but, and then of course he gets another carry and then runs out of bounds and it's just like, dude, get it, just stay in. Um, but yeah, it was interesting that they, they kept doing it when they could have just, could have just kneeled down. And then like, once you got the two carries then, or two or three, whatever it was, then you're just good kneeling down. It was, it was very odd. I, I almost tend to believe there was a little bit of a mix up for a moment where I think in stadium, it made it look like, because I was even confused for a little of like, did the Rams have one more time out or not? Because um, I was looking up at the board and it looked like they did, but then they like took it off. It was, it was just weird huh. in, in the moment. So I, maybe they thought that the Rams had one more time out and they actually didn't. Who knows? Whatever it was, I lean a little bit more in that direction that there was just some confusion as to like if the Rams could stop the clock or what was going on. Um, but who, who knows? It was weird though that they didn't just kneel it down because they – Eventually, I was even like, guys, you could have just kneeled it down. And yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Stadium right, let's continue. rebuilding year for them, too. Well, yeah, exactly. Who knows? <laughs> All right, let's let's go offensive tackle. Um, and this is a this is kind of a two parter. Who do you want to see more of moving forward? Rashid Walker or Yash Nyman? I want to see Nyman. Nyman is more consistent. Um, Walker played probably one of his better games in recent weeks, but it's not been about flash. It's it's never been about flash. It's been about consistency, right? That's why why uh, Walker ended up getting pulled. So I want to see Nyman the rest of the year. Um, maybe I'm the only one on that boat. I understand that uh, they are looking at Walker's contract and saying like, hey, you know, he's under contract for X many years more. You know, what is it? Two after this season. And Nyman is going to be a free agent. Um, I still think 
right now, like we don't know what this offense is. Like I I don't care about the opportunity cost of Walker being solidified at that spot when we don't know what the heck is happening with Bakhtiari, when the team is probably going to be picking in the range where the BPA, you know, the board will probably dictate them picking an offensive tackle anyway. So like, Play Nyman. I, I want to know what we have in love. I want to know what we have in this this offensive game, the offensive passing game. Like, I'm I'm done with the Walker experiment, kind of. <laughs> I see. I actually believe like 95 percent of people are with you. This is this might be hot takey. I actually liked Rashid a little bit better these past two weeks than I liked Yash when 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 Walker came back in. Now he gets the benefit of kind of coming in. Um, and in the game kind of been going on already a little bit. I don't know. Maybe that's helpful. Maybe it's not. But I don't know. Hot, just maybe hot takey. But I actually liked Walker a little bit better than Nyman these past two weeks. Now, I didn't like Walker at all like the three or four weeks before that. And he didn't play well at all. Um, it's, it's close. I I don't know. There's something. I I'm I have a Rashid Walker problem. I can't quit Rashid Walker. Um, and like I said, I might be alone on that island. And if so, oh, that's fine. Rashid and I will hang out on the island together. But I I'm, I lean a little bit more towards Rashid, but I think you are with like 98% of the fan base that would rather have Yash. So we'll we'll agree to disagree, and I will probably eat my words because I think you're probably right. Um, safety, Anthony Johnson Jr., solid first performance. Let's say everyone's healthy. Uh, do you want to see more of Anthony Johnson Jr., or is he slotted correctly behind Savage, Ford, Owens, et cetera? Owens is the interesting one to me. I haven't been super impressed by Owens, but it seems like the coaching staff really likes what Owens brings to the table, probably from uh, hmm, I don't know if I would say like locker room standpoint, but just like from the idea of like he's a vet, he plays assignment football for the most part. He's not the most physically talented guy, but like he also plays a bunch of special teams for him. I would think about the Johnson Owens spot on the depth chart. I don't think he's going to jump forward or savage, um, but he's been playing relatively well. I mean, it's not like these guys were getting tested deep a lot because, you know, Brett Rippon was under center, but right. You know, thumbs up on his performance. A lot of these young guys on the defensive side of the ball have been kind of stepping up, you know, Carrington, him, Carl Brooks, like a lot of guys have been playing pretty well. Totally agreed. Uh, I will say this. I don't know that I necessarily need to see him higher on the depth chart or anything. I would like to see him just in like eight snaps a game. And I don't even know what that looks like. Maybe he ends up being like your like dime safety or something like that, where you just give him a package. I just, I just want to see a little bit more and give him a little bit more taste of the NFL and continue to evaluate him. Like where maybe Savage and Ford are your starters. Maybe Owens is your backup. If somebody goes down and you like need the, the backup to come in and play a bunch of snaps, but you give, you know, you give him, like third safety dimes, you know, snaps or something like it just it, where it's going to be like five to eight plays a game at most. And just to have something that that's kind of where I'm at with it. I, I want to see just a little bit more, but I don't know that you necessarily need to reconfigure everything at this point for it. That's an interesting point because they kind of used Owens like that in the game that Savage went down in, right? Yep. Owens was the dime guy. And that's why Johnson for a couple snaps was actually the guy who came in at safety primarily and then once they ruled out Savage, they were like, okay, Owens is going to play guy. safety and we're just going to not play dime. Um, yeah. Packers don't play a whole ton of dime. but It's like two yeah. snaps. Yeah. I mean, you can get him a couple snaps there, plus the special teams reps that he's playing. I'm all in on those two snaps. All in. Uh, defensive linemen, you mentioned a couple of the rookies making, you know, starting to make a name for themselves. I don't even know how this looks. And maybe it just actually works out with Kenny maybe being out a game or two. We'll see what that ends up being. But uh, Carl Brooks and Colby Wooden – do they need to be a bigger piece of the rotation? They're going to have to, I think. Yeah. Um, even if, you know, Clark is on a little bit of a snap count. Um, Slayton is really the only other nose tackle type of body, and we'll see what they do with Jonathan Ford potentially being a call-up or something like that moving forward. Um, but, I mean, Brooks is the next guy up. I mean, he might end up starting next week. And then yeah. wouldn't have had a nice play. Um I'm definitely more excited about what Brooks has brought to the table than than Wooden, especially uh, the first couple games of the season when Wooden who was kind of getting caved in a little bit. But he did make a nice play last week, so um, they're going to get some looks. I, I wonder if they add a body there. The Packers haven't added 
a, a guy on the 53 man roster to kind of uh, replace the Stokes and Savage moves. So they have 52 right now. I don't think you can go into an NFL game with just four interior defensive mm-hmm. linemen. Um, so you Clark wrong. needs to be healthy. You got to call up Ford from the practice squad. Or you got to add somebody, and I, I don't know. Adding adding someone to be game ready in week ten probably a tough ask. Jonathan Ford was on the initial fifty three. Um, yeah. My guess is they just kind of elevate him up, have him take that spot. Well, Kenny's maybe down for a week or two, whatever it ends up being. Maybe it's nothing. Or we'll even, see. Even if he's on a pitch count, right? Even because yep. like Slayton can't be on the field every single play. Like he, People. that's a guy who. Just from a conditioning standpoint, I don't think he's 330 pounds. You don't want him, you know, doing the Max Crosby endurance challenge, right? <laughs> so, like, I, I I think it makes a lot of sense for Ford to get in some action this week, even if it's just limited snaps. Even this past week, you could tell Slayton early looked, I thought, good in this one. And then as the game went on and Kenny was no longer in there and they had to ask more of Slayton, um, you could tell he wasn't wasn't quite the same towards the uh, second half of that game. And and none like, of the guys that they have on the roster right now can really play that nose tackle role, especially if they get into heavy sets, which is something, you know, Matt Canada is going to try to run the ball against you, you know? Yep. He, he kind of runs – he's not in that McVay tree, but he kind of, like, does some of that similar stuff. Um, Wyatt, I don't think you're comfortable with him. I mean, he's more of a pass rusher anyway than he yep. is, like, a run stopper. Um, You know, we're talking about Carl Brooks potentially being, you know, jumping up from – second line of the depth chart to being a starter wooden being that next guy up on the defensive yep. line like all those guys are pretty small for interior defensive linemen like they kind of hung their hat on Clark and Slayton being able to kind of handle the nose tackle position as the one and two on the depth chart so yep I'm with you it'll be interesting to see but I, I would expect Jonathan Ford either elevated or moved to the 53 this week would be my my guess all right there's a little bit of uh Isaiah McDuffie love this week after a couple plays so let me ask you, do you need to see more of Isaiah McDuffie? I'm not sure. I guess it would have to be for, for Quay or Campbell. I, I, I don't know, but do, do you need more McDuffie in your life? Um, No, but he has been playing well over the past couple of weeks. Um, I think they're playing those linebackers in a really smart way where McDuffie is kind of the base down guy, and then they end up using Eric Wilson probably like 10-ish snaps a game yep. to supplement him in the passing game. Um, they're keeping their legs fresh. I mean, they're still contributing on special teams. They're out there in punt protection, which, again, is the most important position for those guys. Um, thought they really managed the inside linebacker room pretty well. Um, and it's nice to see McDuffie give you anything as, you know, a six-round pick or whatever the heck he was. So, yeah, I mean, the the fact that we haven't been the victims of a bunch of missed tackles in the run game, you know, it goes to credit to uh, McDuffie. Yeah, I thought this is one of his best games. Really liked what he did, but I'm good with him being linebacker three. Um, I like Eric Wilson as linebacker four. I think they've got a, a, a solid set of four linebackers there. Keep Quay and Campbell as your main two. Don't think I need to see anything more. I am contractually obligated, though, to ask you if you need more Dontavian Wicks in your life because uh, we haven't brought him up yet. He did He did have two big mistakes in the last two weeks, a drop two weeks ago um, and a fumble last or this past week, which is not great for the brand. Uh, but... Do you need do you need more Dontavian Wicks still? Let him grow. Let him grow. I don't care. Like it, this was the point of the season, right? Is to you know, hey, these guys are flashy. Let's feed the flashy guys and see how how far it can take us, you know, moving forward. Like keep playing Wicks. I don't care. Yep. Like, he had the fumble, totally. that was a dumb fumble. Don't reach out the ball. Live and learn. Don't make that same mistake like he still brings some stuff to the table that I'm pretty excited about. And he totally consistently hits these overs. He hit the reception and yards over in this game. So I'm happy. Didn't seem like they really increased his snap count that whole much, even since, what, two weeks ago when LaFleur waxed poetic about him. So I think I, I think it is going to continue to grow, though. And, I, again, I don't know, like, at the expense of who or whatever, but, to, again, we, we've been through this, but, like, Give me almost equal Dobbs, Watson, Reed, Wicks snaps at this point. Um, you know, if there's 160 snaps out there total for wide receivers, split them four ways. Have Let them each have 40, give or take five here or there. I don't really care, but uh, I still need more Wicks in my life, and I think he's going to make fewer and fewer mistakes. You can tell he's still, you know, young, inexperienced, still thinking out there. He's probably trying to do a little bit too much, play a little bit too fast. I think the game's going to slow down for him, and when it does, 
I'm still all in on look the heck out because I think he's going to ball out once the game does slow down for him. All right, a couple of quick ones before we get out of here. I just want to hear your your thoughts on offensive offsides. I got to know uh, where, where you at. We got like an assistant software engineer or something calling these penalties. What the hell are we doing? <laughs> I don't understand because on every single one of those plays, the center is the furthest guy out. Mm -hmm. Plus he's extending the ball out. And then they're like, he's breaking the plane of the ball. I'm like, he's clearly not breaking. Like, use your eyes. Why are we calling this penalty now? I think they even showed a replay in the game and um, on the Jumbotron, and they showed Matt LaFleur on the sideline, you know, pointing at it and saying some expletives at the uh, referee. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's bull crap. I don't understand what the heck they were doing there. I mean, again, that's part of why the Packers offense was so slow in the first half, too. Yep. Yeah, I have no idea. And that, whether it's a point of emphasis, it should never be a point of emphasis. If it's something egregious, of course, call it whatever. Like that is, that's going to be the new, you can call that on every play if you want to. Um, and I don't think anyone wants that. I don't think, yeah, it's just, it's crazy. And I I don't get it at all. There, there's, there was nothing that gave Green Bay any advantage on that play. Nothing that I'm sure hasn't happened in a hundred games, you know, this year it, and was not called. It was very, very weird and bizarre, and I don't like it, and I don't want it ever again. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Um, all right, a couple other things. Uh, what did you think of Jordan Love this week? Uh, second half, the first half, really, um, and then holds on to the ball a little long. And that kind of can cut both ways, right? You could get stuff popping open over the middle of the field late, which you know people say you don't want to do that, but Sometimes you want to do that. Sometimes there's a yep. dig that pops open late and stuff. Um, will be interesting to see how that plan works when, uh, you know, Watt is rushing you as a passer and all those Steelers guys are pinning their ears back trying to get after you. So um, kind of more TVD there than anything else. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. I, I think it was a little bit lower on Love this week. It was, I, it was still a positive performance, in my opinion. I just there was a couple yeah. throws I wanted a bit more accurate. A couple sacks he took that I didn't think he needed to take. I'll just put it this way: I, I think for the most part, I've seen kind of the same Jordan Love week in and week out. I do think there's signs of progress there from time. There's a flash play or two every single week that gives you a lot of hope. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, this was kind of the same Jordan Love experience that I saw: some ups, some downs, some positives, some negatives, some things to work on. Nowhere near ready to quit. Nowhere near ready to be like, yep, he's the guy. Just kind of somewhere in the middle. And that's not necessarily a bad place to be in your your eighth start of what of his career at this point. So, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with where it's at overall. Yeah. I mean, a whole lot of these things, it's just like, I don't know. Super send me to uh, December 11th and let me know yeah. what it looks like by that point. Like, this next month is going to be really important. If – Anyone says that they have answers about what this team is, I kind of think they're fibbing. Yeah, I think so too. I, I'm i very intrigued to see what happens in these next four games for a variety of different reasons, but I think it'll be four really big games for Jordan, um, and uh, and hopefully he, he rises to the chat. I, I don't think we've seen a really bad Jordan game yet, and I bet we get one before the end of the season. I don't think we've seen a really great Jordan game yet, and I bet we get one before the end of the season. That's that's my one prediction I will say. I think we're going to get an awesome Jordan game that makes you go, oh, like I didn't know he had that in his arsenal. I think we're going to get one really bad Jordan game that makes you go like, oh, that's I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Like I don't, I don't like that. So I think there, I think there's going to be one of each of those yet, um, and then I think it's going to be a lot of the same stuff that we've already seen. But you never know. You never know when it clicks for a guy and he slows down and all of a sudden look the heck out. And hopefully that's the case for Jordan sooner rather than later. Uh, any quick thoughts on Packers Steelers? Just that pass rush, man. Yeah. Have a plan. Have a plan because those guys are coming after you. Have a, have more of an Aaron Donald plan than the Max Crosby and Aiden Hutchinson plans that did not go according to plan. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how they respond to that too. Obviously, Max Crosby wreck that entire game for the Packers offense. They clearly can't let that happen with TJ Watt in this one. If he does, Pittsburgh probably just wins. Um, so yeah, they're going to have to have have that a, a plan A, B, and C and make sure that whatever it is, he he cannot be the one to beat you, um, and which is, of course, easier said than done. And then last but not least, because we are nerds and uh, because we love talking about this stuff, 
Uh, I thought you brought up an interesting point. Keaton Mitchell, who I'm sure most people are not super familiar with, although maybe a little bit more familiar with from fantasy purposes this past week. Um, he's a super fast, really fun running back, undrafted free agent for the Baltimore Ravens. I think he had a 60 yarder and a 40 yarder this past week and um, had one of the highest yards over expected for a running, like a rookie running, something like that. Um, just a really fun player. They haven't used him a ton yet. He's been a bit banged up. He started the year on IR and then he had, um, yeah, I think he missed last week uh, or like the, whatever previous week with an injury as well. But he, he came back this week, had a really impressive performance in minimal snaps. But it's an interesting one because Green Bay had him in for a pre-draft visit and he was like this undrafted guy. And a lot of times Green Bay likes those undrafted vi uh, like free agent visits ahead of time to sort of recruit those players. Also interesting in juxtaposition that when the seventh round came around, they go with Lou Nichols and draft him, who they also had in for a pre-draft visit, pass on Keaton Mitchell. Not sure if they still try to get Mitchell in after they drafted Nichols or not. Whatever it was, it didn't go according to plan. He's now a Baltimore Raven and has looked pretty good in very limited snaps so far. Yeah. Um, thought the Packers draft uh, plan in the last couple of years have been interesting. Obviously, the team hasn't had a lot of cap space that they could just spend on taking flyers on undrafted guys. Um, if you actually look at kind of what the financials work out as, it's cheaper to sign a, or to draft a guy in the seventh round and give him a slated bonus than what most of these top level undrafted right. free agents are getting on the open market. Yeah. Um, so obviously that has impacted Green Bay's draft strategy. It's one reason why they're drafting eleven guys every draft and have another eleven picks in the in this draft upcoming. Um, those late round picks, you know, really once you're talking about the seventh round, I, I think it's a lot more of calling dibs on undrafted free agents than it is like we have yep. a top fifty grade on this guy and he <laughs> fell to us. Oh my god! Like that's not really how it works out. I think that's why you see a guy like Lou Nichols. Um, in a similar situation, he ends up going seventh. So in the seventh, I wonder if, uh, you know, Mitchell would have been that next guy up if Nichols wasn't on the board anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, that one hurts a little bit because Nichols now what he's on the Eagles practice squad and Mitchell's making plays for the Ravens. So, yeah, stings a little, uh, he was a really fun player. He's somebody I liked coming out of college. I was hoping they would either take a late round flyer on or, sign as an undrafted free agent. It's tough because I don't know what he ended up. Uh, now I'm very curious what he ended up getting. Did you check to see what he got in? Uh, um, I, I don't I don't know what he got in terms of the financials, but I do remember, you know, if we're talking about the consensus draft board, um, he was one of the like highest ranked guys who didn't yep. end up getting drafted. He was a guy who was talked about as like an early day three pick, like a fourth, fifth type of guy. It was kind of actually a little bit surprising. Um, that yep. he actually didn't get drafted. So he got a he got an eighteen thousand dollar signing bonus only, but fifty five thousand of his base salary guaranteed. So he got seventy three thousand guaranteed, basically. Um, I think yeah, the not, Packers spent close to that amount of guaranteed money on their entire undrafted <laughs> class. Yeah, yeah so I think like, it would have been less. Yeah, not, so, not probably weren't in that conversation. Is the this is probably the easy way to say it? If they probably got, like, I bet they called, and I bet oh, there yeah. was a quick hang up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably true. I, I think that the, probably the larger story here is if they wanted him, they needed to go with him over Lou Nichols. They did not. They had a higher draft grade on Lou Nichols. Or again, that's why you bring him in for a free agent visit is because you know maybe you wanted to check something out. Maybe that conversation or that visit did not go great. Like those are the things that we can watch the player on the field and just have no idea how some of that stuff went. Um, maybe he was insanely immature and it, like, we just have no idea, but uh, whatever it was, they decided to go to Lou Nichols, Pete Mitchell, really fun start to his career. And uh, that might be one that we look back at. There's one this week. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard the Packers. Uh, they could have drafted TJ Watt. Just, I don't know if you've ever heard that before, um, but they decided not to. Um, I've heard it a couple times. I've heard it <laughs> but, uh, a couple times. Uh, hopefully, Hopefully we're not talking in 10 years of like, man, they, they could add Keaton Mitchell over uh, over Lou Nichols. Um, that's that's one that stings. I don't think it's going to be that, but interest, like just because we're nerds, we love going over that stuff and uh, always fun conversations to have as it is every single week. Justice, always appreciate it. Where can we find all of your work and uh, find you on social media? Find me at acmepackingcompany.com. Uh, subscribe to our podcast feed. Find it wherever 
you know, you find your podcast. You can find me on Twitter at J U M O S Q. I have one more thing on the yeah, way. Oh, yeah, let's go. let's go. Packers picked up a running back, Ellis Merriweather. I, uh, Small world. I know the guy who coached his offensive line at Garden City Community College in Kansas sent him a text earlier, asked him what he thought of him. He says, great kid, tough SOB. So that's the uh, scouting report on Ellis Merriweather, the running back that the Packers just picked up on the practice squad. I'll take it. I'll take it. Good kid, tough SOB. I'm all in. Um, Thoughts on them releasing James Robinson in in the corresponding move? (laughs) I cut up all of those Giants carries that he had this <laughs> so preseason. Sorry. He looks like a guy who never recovered from that 2021 Achilles injury, and I think that's kind of the story. I mean, he signed a two-year, $8 million contract with the uh, Patriots this offseason, and I don't even think he got to putting on the pads. I think it was all yeah. just OTA stuff by the time he was released. Um, you know, he was in Giants camp, got released from Giants camp, like – I just think it's an unfortunate story of how limiting those Achilles injuries can be in terms of your explosiveness. And, you know, they kicked the tires on him, let him go within a month. So, yeah. And Green Bay took a quick look at him. Obviously, it wasn't to be. And now they got a tough SOB in his place. So I will take the trade off. Again, follow him uh, at Acme Packing Company, again, at J-U-M-O-S-Q. You can find me at Andy Herman NFL. And again, with the Pack-A-Day podcast, 365 days a year. We will see you back here next week. Does Green Bay have a winning streak? We will find out. But until next time, and as always, go Pack-O.